But for right now, I want us to concentrate on some scriptures. And this telecast is dedicated to this one thing, to tell you how to be saved so that you truly know that you're born again, you've been converted, there's different words for it, you've had an experience of eternal life with God, and you've got the inner witness and knowledge and assurance that should you die at this moment, you know, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now, there's a lot of people trying to teach religious things, and many of them are a million miles off the mark. But the Bible gives us the clear teaching because Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And I'm going to tell you how to be saved for time and for eternity and for sure and to know it. You will not have to pay any money. You don't have to send me a dime. You don't have to join a certain church. You just have to do certain things, quite simple, but do them sincerely that I'm going to point out to you. I don't know where you are watching this telecast. You may be in jail. You may be in hospital. You may be in a bar, a hotel room, at home. Wherever you are, not just physically and geographically, but wherever you are in life, God is coming to you right now through my words, my presence on this television screen in order to be a light unto you, to teach you how to get right with God without money, without price, and without good works, just by trusting Him and what He did for us on Mount Calvary 2,000 years ago. Of course, it begs the question, do you want to be saved? Is it not near time you got saved? Maybe already you are a grandmother or a grandfather. Life is passing by for all of us. It's time to be saved. The summer is ended and the harvest is past, says the Bible, and we are not yet saved. Don't let it go another day, for no man knows what the morrow might bring forth. This is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the day of the provocation in the Old Testament. This is your day to be gloriously saved. I'm going to tell you how. And then I hope that you'll call or email me and tell me that you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior. That would be my joy. But first of all, let's go over a few of the things that you don't have to do. You don't have to do in order to be saved. No money involved. There was a famous statement many, many years ago when Johann Tetzel, this was in Europe, was begging for money. And the slogan for Martin Luther was, send Martin Luther no money. So I'm saying to you, money has nothing to do with this. You don't have to have a special education. You don't have to have a special color in your skin. You don't have to be from a special ethnic group. Whosoever will may come. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your condition is, if you're not yet saved and need to be saved, then that immediately makes you qualified to be saved. Just the fact you're not saved qualifies you to be saved and to come to Christ. And it's a fantastic thing. For not only will he give you power to live for him while you're on this earth, but the assurance that when the day comes that you pass away, you're going to be with him forever not in purgatory. Purgatory is a man-made idea dreamed up by man to make money. Forget the purgatory. It doesn't come into it. When we die, if we're saved, we go straight to be with the Lord. If we're not, we go straight to a lost eternity. Let's look 
at some of the things that Paul said to the church at Rome, the Roman church. And you follow me real carefully, even though it's all rather simple. But follow me carefully. Here's what Paul said in chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, of course, the Jewish people, Israel, they'd be upset at hearing that because how dare he say that they should be saved? They not only believed they were saved, they believed that they were the only ones that were saved or that would ever be saved. But they didn't understand the term being saved. Didn't understand what it means to have eternal life. You don't have to be of a special race. You don't have to be a goody two-shoes. You just have to be a person who has an understanding of their need of Christ, who's the only one that can save us. Nobody else can save you. Not the Pope, not the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, not the Dalai Lama. Nobody can save you except Jesus Christ. He and he alone can save. If you're in the place where you know you need to be saved and you realize only Jesus can save you, God wants to do business with you at this very moment. So Paul said, my heart's desire. The word is my heart's longing, my heart's moving prayer is that my fellow countrymen, the Jews, might get saved. My prayer is that you who are watching me at this moment, that you might get saved. It's so vital, not only because it gives you joy, your name's entered in heaven, your sins are forgiven, you'll be with the Lord forever one day, but look what you avoid. You don't go to hell and the burning fires thereof. You miss the consequences of not being saved. This is serious business we're talking about. Verse 2 says something remarkable, Romans 10. For he said, talking about the Jews, I bear them record, or I'll give them this. I'll admit this. What? For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They were on fire for God as it were, but all along the wrong lines. For it says they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now, it's possible to be so dedicated in one way to God, and you're doing this and this and this and this to please Him, and yet you could be off course by a million miles. For example, you could be paying and praying to get a loved one out of purgatory who previously died. But there's no purgatory. So that's the road to no time. Don't do that. You could be a precious Mormon friend who keeps on getting baptized for the dead. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. That's foolish and wrong doctrine. You say, well, you don't need to be so straight about it. Listen, time's moving on. We better get to the point. Mormonism cannot save you. It's a false cult. You may say, well, I'm selling books for the Jehovah Witnesses and I'm scoring brownie points with God. It doesn't mean anything. I one time heard a man say, it doesn't amount up to 15 cents worth of nothing. Kind of a rare way to put it, but it's meaningless. And Paul said here regarding the Jews who were trying to keep the law, you know, washing their hands and their pots and their pans and trying to keep up to the law. And they were so zealous in doing that but Paul said that zealousness is getting you nowhere regarding being saved. For the old law was simply to teach us two things. Number one, to show God's almighty standard, but number two, to show us we can't keep it. And therefore, we're led to the school teacher, Christ, who instructs us how to keep it. How do we keep the law? In Christ, because he kept it, and we get into him, and he gets into us, and then our prices paid for salvation by him. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Isn't that sad? Are you praying to Mary? Your prayers are getting not above the ceiling. You can't pray to Mary. That's not taught in the Bible. Are you praying to the saints? You can forget it. it doesn't work. Paul said you have plenty with zeal, but you got no knowledge. You know what you're doing. And then a powerful, magnificent. I mean, I could take up all the superlatives trying to describe this verse. 
from Paul in verse 3. Here it is. For they, with their ignorance in pursuing zealous works relating to the law, which would never get them saved, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, God's righteousness there, the word righteousness is a Greek word, dk usine, and it means where God gives us the gift of righteousness. It's like, you know, going to the theater and not having a ticket, but somebody steps up right at the last moment and pays your ticket for you. They did it for you. When Jesus died on Calvary, God took Christ's standard of righteousness and he gives it to us. But they were ignorant. They were trying to establish their own righteousness, which was off the law. Do, do, don't do, 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 don't do. It was getting them nowhere. And Paul said, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, the God kind of righteousness, the by faith righteousness, as A.T. Robertson, the great Greek scholar, calls it. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and, unfortunately, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God or the gift of D.K. Usine. You know that you can get God's standard of righteousness imputed to you free in response to your trust and nothing else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not your righteousness. It clearly says it. Matthew 6, clearly says it, that we seek his righteousness, his perfect righteousness. Well, how in the world can I get the perfect righteousness of God? I'm a human being. That's the miracle of it. We can't get it through our works, through our money, through our education, or anything else. We can get it by our trust in God, trusting what Jesus did on Calvary. When he cried out, it is finished. The price was paid, the law was fulfilled, and now whosoever will can come unto him and have everlasting life. It's a terrific story. It's the greatest story ever told. It's the message of glorious salvation. But religion has messed it up. You turn on large sections of Christian television and, and listen to those Protestant preachers. They'll get you all mixed up because they demand money for everything. You listen to the Catholic teachers. They'll give you stuff that's not remotely in the Bible about Mary and about the Pope and about purgatory and about praying to the saints. They'll get you mixed up. All these false cults will get you mixed up. Look what the scripture says. I'll read it again. They, I wonder does this apply to you, being ignorant of God's glorious gift of imputed, imparted righteousness. And they go about to establish their own righteousness, which gets them nowhere. They have not surrendered and submitted themselves to receive the gift of the righteousness of God, which is given as a gift and received by trust and faith and nothing else. After a little bit, I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray it after me, right there where you are. And when you do, as you believe, and I'll be believing with you, you're going to be saved. You say, I can't believe it. I don't have to pay. No. Don't even have to go to church. No. It's a good idea to go to church, the right kind of church, of course. But you don't have to do that to get saved. You get saved by trusting the finished work of Christ on Calvary. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What can wash away my sin? What can wash away your sin and your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make you whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me white as snow. I want you to know, friends, you can be saved by the blood that was shed on Calvary's tree 2,000 years ago. But there's more. For in Romans 10, verse 4, he said, Christ is, now get this, the end of the law for righteousness. What is that? The end of the law for righteousness. The Greek word is telos. It's come to an end. Like watching a movie and it says the end. It's over. What is over? The old law system in the Old Testament, which said that you had to be righteous by your works, 
Christ put an end to that because it didn't work. It couldn't work because we don't have the strength nor the ability to meet God's standard. So Paul said, Christ is the end of that. That system is over. It failed. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who watch, pays money, joins a special church, to everyone who believes. That is, puts their full trust in Christ and what he did to save them when he died on Golgotha's tree. It is such a wonderful thing to be saved. And you've thought about it before. You've thought about it many times, perhaps, and you've thought also, I can't do it because I could never keep it. Sure you couldn't, but he'll keep it for you, and he'll keep you too. Isn't it wonderful? I got saved on my 11th birthday. That means that every time the 25th of May comes around, I've got two birthdays on the one day, my natural physical birthday and my spiritual birthday. But let me say this quickly. If you hear somebody saying, I'm saved, I'm saved for time and for eternity, please don't think that they're boasting within themselves or that they're being arrogant. They're not doing that. They're simply saying that they have accepted Christ's offer of salvation and they passed from spiritual death onto spiritual life. And I do know sometimes if you hear a person saying, I'm saved, it may appear that they are being kind of super holy above everybody else. It doesn't mean that. It's just like if you got a new car. You wouldn't be embarrassed to say to somebody, I got a new car. Well, likewise, when we get saved and we accept Christ, it's all right to say, I accepted Christ, therefore I'm born again, therefore my sins are forgiven, therefore my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, therefore if I should die today, I'd go straight to be with the Lord. No purgatory, there's no such place. That was dreamed up by man to make money. These are glorious truths of salvation. The word for salvation in the Greek, soterion, it means we got saved, we're being saved, we will be saved, we'll be saved for time and eternity. We're saved today, tomorrow, we're saved for sure, we're saved forever. We keep trusting Christ. It's marvelous. I'm going to pray with you right now. I have more scriptures, but I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Are you ready? I'll do it slowly to ask Jesus into your heart. You may feel in a bad condition in your mind, in your spirit. You may feel you've committed terrible sins, either drugs, adultery, pornography. Maybe you're drunk or half drunk many times during the week. I don't know what it is. Maybe you've stolen goods. Maybe you've stolen on your very employer. Let me say this. Christ can save all of us. Why? Because the blood goes deeper than the stain has gone. There's not a sin that he can't forgive. So I'm ready to pray. It's a simple prayer. You pray it after me. And if you're sincere, and I know you are, you're going to be saved. You're going to be born again. Then you're going to call or email and let me know. Just pray this prayer after me. Are you ready? Here we go. Just say Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I fully realize I just can't make it by myself. I have failed so many times. But I know, O oh Lord, that you promised if I would come to you, you would never cast me away. Therefore, O oh God Almighty, I come to you at this very moment. And here is my humble prayer. Now keep going, just as you're doing it. Here's the prayer. Repeat this after me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Take sin away. 
forgive all my sins, for I confess I am a sinner. But I cast myself on your mercy. And at this second, I receive you as my eternal Lord and Savior. And I thank God I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm converted. I belong to Christ. And should I die today, I'll go straight to be with the Lord. In Jesus' name. That's a kind of a long prayer. But you see, there was no money involved, was there? There was no special education needed. It was simply a heart turning toward God. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. What you must do now is to start to thank God. Say, thank God I'm saved. Thank God I prayed with that preacher on television and I'm saved. I'm born again. Tell others and tell me by phone or email or letter, whatever is convenient. Here's another scripture. It's a very famous one. Tell me what you think of this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What happened was, this was a reference to the children of Israel way back in the Old Testament. They had sinned against God. Serpents were among them and biting them. Many were very ill and many had died. Moses said, what will I do for the people are repenting and asking for your help, O Lord. What will I do? God told him to make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and put it away up in an elevated position, and said, whoever looks upon it, with a concentrated look, whoever looks at it, whoever stares at it, is going to be healed. And so in the New Testament, that analogy is carried forth. But we're not talking about a serpent on a pole. We're talking about Christ dying on the cross. And here's what it says in the book of John. Just the way Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believe that's you, whosoever believeth, that's you, you've just done it, should not perish, should not lose their soul, should not be a loser anymore in life. Apollomy is the word, but have eternal life. Now listen to the sweetest words ever written. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth well, you're part of the whosoever, and so am I. Believeth, trusteth Christ. Not trusting your own religious works or the arm of the flesh or your prayers or going to church or your money, nothing like that. You trust Christ and you trust Him alone, what He did on the cross. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but they will have, they actually possess it, not that they'll have a rain check for it, not that someday they'll get it, but they shall have eternal life, everlasting life. I'll read that one again without comment. Listen to it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's one, one other one I want to read to you at this time, and it's a marvelous scripture. Oh, the scriptures are marvelous anyway, aren't they? They thrill my soul. I've been reading them for, what is it? I don't know, 60 years. They get better all the time. Acts 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Isn't that it all summed up? Neither is there salvation in any other. No church, no preacher, no pope, no archbishop. Neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not through Joseph Smith, not through Brigham Young or anybody else, through Christ and Christ alone. Now I'm not quite through with this. We're talking about accepting Christ so that we don't perish eternally in the lake of fire, but that we live forever with him. Isn't it glorious to be born again, to be saved, to know that you're right with God for time and for eternity because of what Jesus did? It's not because of our goodness and righteousness. Of course not. Paul was writing to the Philippian church, the saints of God who were at Philippi. This is what he said in chapter 3 and verse 9. And be found in him, that's in Christ, not having my own righteousness. One of the saddest things I've ever seen happened many years ago when I happened to be in Mexico City, in old Mexico, of course, and uh, I visited a large Catholic chapel there, a large church. It was uh, dedica dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And outside, there were, I don't know, probably hundreds of people, and they were lined up kind of Disney style, you know, like this, and several on their knees. And it was moving rather slowly, and they were trying to get in because when you get in there and shuffled up to a certain point, there was a little sort of statuette like this size of the Virgin Mary. And you could lean over and either kiss it or kiss it this way with your fingers. And then if you did that, you got a special blessing from God. It was pagan. It was heathen. It had nothing to do with God. And those poor people, very poor people in both senses, poor financially but in darkness spiritually, were trying to find forgiveness of sins and peace with God through that act. It doesn't mean a thing. Nothing. I felt it was so cruel on those poor people. There's one other one I'd like to tell you about. There's a place in Ireland, my home country, called Knock. And people go there each year for a pilgrimage where they climb up a mountain. And you know, if you go up that mountain and you get scraped and hurt and bruised and battered, they even have ambulances at the bottom. You do that in order to score points with God, to get sins forgiven, and to get right with God. They even have ambulances at the bottom. And if you break your leg or break your head or something, why, my goodness, you're going to have special blessings because you suffered and you paid the price. It's all an exercise in total futility. It means nothing before God. In fact, it's the very opposite to what God teaches. Here's what Paul says. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Please, brother or sister, man, woman, Whoever you are, please let the light explode. Let the penny drop. Let the bell ring. See the truth. Hear the truth. Don't be misled by religious leaders, either, whether it's the Pope or Joseph Smith or whoever, anybody else. Don't be misled. Look at what the Scriptures say. Uh, be found in him not having my own righteousness, not having mine own righteousness, not having mine own righteousness, which is off the law. That's me trying to do this and trying to do that or not doing this and not doing that as a means of salvation. That's not the means of salvation. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is off the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I've got to repeat that whole verse, this time without comment, so listen to it. It's Paul speaking to the church at Philippi in this marvelous letter. It's chapter 3, and it's verse 9. And be found in Christ, by accepting him, by the way, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of which is of God by faith. Isn't that a terrific scripture? My goodness, I just love that one so much. And I'd like to give you another scripture. 
It says here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 again, the Apostle Paul, what a writer that man was. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, not in a certain church, don't let them deceive you on that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, by accepting him as our Savior and Lord, he is a new creature, a brand new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, that's not primarily talking about old habits have passed away and all things have become new. And that's true too. God will help you along that line as well. It's not talking about that. What it's actually talking about is something different. Let me read it again and I'll, I'll explain it. Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. That is the old systems that we used to try to use in order to be saved. And a brand new system has come. Everything's new about this system. I used to think, let me paraphrase it. I used to think I could be saved by my prayers, by, by, by my lighting candles, by talking to the saints, etc., 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 going to church on Sunday. I used to think, but the, those old things have passed away. The old system is gone. A brand new system has come in. And what is the brand new system? Just trust God because Jesus already paid everything. Imagine if you were going into the theater, as I talked about earlier, in a little illustration, and somebody paid your ticket, you know, and, and as you're walking in and the crowd's there all around you and the crowd's behind you, and you said to your friend, well, wait a minute, could we stop here and let me cook you a dinner just to say thank you? Let me do something to merit this. My goodness, the friend would say, you crazy. It's a gift. Accept the gift and move on in. It's a gift. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old way of trying to be saved is gone. In fact, the Bible tells us about the word repentance. It's not penance. It's repentance. And you know what the word repentance is? Metanoia. You know what it really means? It means just to change your mind. To change your mind about what? About the way that you used to think you, you got saved. And you switch to a new way of realizing you don't get saved by your own righteousness, by your own works. You only get saved by trusting Christ and his glorious, wonderful sacrifice for us. When he came, he died, he was buried, he rose, he ascended, and today he ever lives to make intercession for us. It's all of him. It's not of me. As the old song says, wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Tell them again to me, wonderful words of life. One of my favorite old hymns is, Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Do you want to hear the old, old story? It's not what you can do for God. It's what God has already done for you through Christ when he died and shed his blood and paid the price. Now we don't understand all the details, but we do know this is truth. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now listen to this. This is shocking. Religion has sent more people to hell than any other force in the world. If you go to the bar and you get half drunk, and ask the barman the way to heaven, he's going to be honest enough and tell you, I don't know the way to heaven. I'm going to hell just like you are. They're honest out in the world. It's when you get messed up with religiosity and start to follow man and not the scriptures. They will give you their system, and their system leads to everlasting hell. Old things have passed away. The old system has passed away. The new system has arrived. All things have become new. What was the old system? The old system said, pay your debt or die. The new system of grace says, relax, I've paid it for you. You can live.